Hello, and welcome to episode number 340 of the Armin Show podcast, where we are always learning more, branching out, science, creativity, people, subscribe if you haven't, all those things, more is coming on the way. On this episode, we have a wonderful, different, we're going into the fiction realm and to a far-off nation, we have France. My guest today is the great Mylise Besseri, author. She has written multiple books. We will get into them. My Elise, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you. I'm happy to have you on. You are an author, but you have been part of France culture before for radio. Can you tell us, take us through your path to where you are today? Well, uh, yes, I um, have a long time. I've passed a long time at the radio. Uh, it's 19 years I'm working for the French National Radio. I uh, was doing documentaries, meeting a lot of artists all over the world, writers, painters, um, photographers, and uh, and film directors. And um, I was also uh, working on cultural um, documentaries, but also social subjects, social issues. And uh, then I moved to also live programs uh, on national radio called France Culture. And always in touch with um, literature, and uh, the art world. And um, a few years ago, um, I, uh, I started to, to write a book, which was a kind of answer to a documentary I did about uh, uh, James Joyce in Paris. And um, there was these strange relationships between uh, James Joyce and uh, Sam Beckett. And I was thought, oh, I wonder I knew more about these two being together, you know, uh, uh, famous writers uh, in, in Paris and the time they spent together. And of course, Beckett was very young at the time, but he kind of um, were very close to the master that Joyce was at the time and, and worked for him and helped him in research and all that. And I just had this idea that maybe I could write a novel about this relationship that would be um, a kind of uh, a kind of uh, um, way to experience uh, the way people can write in a foreign language that Becca did, you know, and have this uh, fiction that would be a kind of bridge between Ireland and France and between uh, between also two languages, which is English, the specific English the spoken island and uh, and French and also to uh, wonderful literature. So this idea um, brought me to to write this story. And then that was the story of the first book, um, Samuel Beckett's uh, in his last months um, in Paris in a nursing home where he kind of ended um, as one of his own character, uh, you know, and uh, I had this idea that maybe I could write into his mind and make him talk and uh, let the reader imagine what were his thoughts when he was there and that the, the nursing home became a kind of stage. I like this, that you took the liberty to place yourself in there and alter things. One thing that came to mind early on was what value do you give to written license or the ability to try things or imagine and not worry about how things were? I mean, fiction in reality? I don't really care about that much. I mean, as far as you pay a tribute to the reader you write about, as far as you do respect his work and the big lines of his biography, um, I think you can take all the freedom you want, uh, but the respect uh, you need to, to, to have, well, that's just my own way to think about that, is uh, that you should know very well what you're talking about. And, you know, I've done all the research and, and know uh, the, the kind of person he was. And so you have all the freedom to imagine. I mean, nobody knows what Beckett thought. Nobody was inside in head. So I, I have all the, the freedom to imagine, you know, this wonderful old man um, in his last months having kind of fun watching around what the absurd word is a nursing home and how crazy and funny, you know, is it, you know, to be in this tragic place and, and him experiencing all he has written about. And, and 
at the time, I didn't really realize that it was a kind of challenge uh, because I, I had so much fun writing it that I, I really noticed that afterwards, you know, when my publisher said to me, oh, oh, my God, you know, it was, it's quite a challenge to do that. And, and I, I haven't thought about that before. I just had so much fun doing it. I see a connection. We have a link there that I like the element of I don't have to go by the guidelines. Plus, this is the thing that's fun for me with the challenge. And the end result uh, is the best response to any sort of uh, limitation. It's the feeling you get when you actually do things that suit you. And it's a little bit of risk taking, which is a nice feature. You mentioned absurdism. I noticed a few of the individuals that you have uh, covered or written about. They have, I looked at their uh, pages to look at their main philosophies. Some have absurdism in there. What are your thoughts on absurdism, our reality? Should we be taking it so seriously? There's a kind of, um, it, it's funny because um, the oldness was also the subject, you know, of, of the first novel, oldness, and how this great man, this wonderful writer, this Nobel Prize uh, kind of survive in this, uh, in this place and how he kind of stayed the same person, you know, even in, in this difficult time of the end of life and how he can also keep his um, his word with him, you know, all the reading and all the art. And this helps him, me, him living and moving on because he has everything he has experienced in his life, in his mind. And so he can tell himself stories, you know, in his, in his place. So um, I... I had this idea that there's a kind of very slim frontier between reality and dream and imagination. And that's what readers and writers do. I mean, a reader is, is, is having a journey with the book. And, and so the writer's job is much more to, to make things bearable in a way, you know? And uh, so this experience between real facts and, and daily life and those small details which are, which are completely absurd. I mean, you have the menu, you know, in the nursing home, oh, and you're going to have this soup and these things. And oh, he's having fun about the way the, you know, the rules and everything is written in a very, uh, you know, formal way. And he's still having fun with French language because that's, um, that's the land for writing for him, you know, that's, that's the land of, uh, of play. And, and so he has his, uh, you know, he's having fun thinking, oh, if I was rewriting the rules, what kind of vocabulary I would, I would try to use. And, and so this absurdity is, is the absurdity of the condition of being old and being in that place and having to be washed like a child. And, but also, it, it, it's also absurd because of the, the, the condition, which is everybody's condition, like telling us small stories about details of life and how I'm going to wash and having a bath and doing that. And also having some metaphysical uh, questions about the word and this kind of moving from one to another and, and having a kind of nap and waking up and thinking about something else and thinking about memories he has from Ireland and he's having a kind of full journey without moving from his, from his, uh, his bedroom. Old age represents a few things. Multiple things are going through my mind here, but at that time you become a bit more fearless, willing to just say things. The absurd, you start to notice what reality was at that time. This morning I saw out of nowhere on the internet a quote that came up that related to this about uh, the writing. It said, it was by somebody, I don't know them, but it said, if we only let people play exactly who they are, it'll be the death of imagination. So that concept, you didn't let the individual play just who they were. You imagined and added on to it, which is an element of addition. It's like you're creating versus just rehashing the past in some form, which I think should be the default as compared with just take the story and repeat the story, not exactly, and then repeat it again. It's not as interesting that way. Mm. I saw that quote today. Now, as far as death, this is a theme I've noticed. Well, first, before that, what, what can you tell us the name of that book and um, if it won any awards of sorts? The first book is called Le Tiers Temps, which was the name of the nursing home right. where, he, where Beckett stayed. This is wonderful. It won an award I would like to mention, the Goncourt. Can you tell us about that? Goncourt first novel. It's uh, it's not as big as the Goncourt itself. It's the Goncourt first novel, oh, okay. um, and uh, which is the first prize you can have for the first novel, 
which is which was yeah great news for me because the book was out just before the lockdown for four weeks before the French lockdown and so I thought the book was dead you know first book being out uh, just a few weeks before the lockdown and all the bookshops and everything was closed and and then the day uh, everything reopened the day the lockdown finished uh, I received this huge prize and it was I felt so lucky and and, and grateful and uh, and really to to have that and I I was very really lucky to have that so the book could kind of resuscitate and um, so yeah that's cool <laughs> It's nice to bring it life and the timing is a key thing we can't plan out all the timings for life sometimes it works out in our favor sometimes it can cancel something we're doing but we do our part and then we let time do do its part death is a common theme also that one with old age when you think of death uh for your writing how do you want to represent it do we not look at it enough as people thoughts on that I thought that oldness was a very inspiring subject for many reasons. Uh, the first reason is probably that I wanted to write far from me. I mean, far from my own condition, far from myself. And I was very happy to write about an old man that would be completely the opposite of yeah, my life and very different background. And and I, I felt like it's a kind of empathetic um, uh, you know, thing to write about someone who's very different to you. And so it's it's a kind of musical work you do. It's, uh, uh, you really have to imagine like, like an actor, like a comedian, that to, you become someone else and you find the way they talk, the way they think. And when you know so well your character, I mean, you don't know, you just, you know, find out what kind of character you make. But for Beckett, because he's a public person, because people has read him, haven't heard him because he was never doing interviews or very few, but everybody knew about his life because of the famous biography of James Nelson. And, and of course they knew about the work. And so I had to invent a character that would be close to reality and to find a voice that would be different from the way he writes, but that would be um, possible for him. So it was a kind of um, specific work for me to use uh, a language that would be um, a bit like my great grandparents age, something like that, you know, like to use another kind of French language, which is something I like very much and oldness uh, helped me doing that, you know, as a subject. So I could use a kind of, um, not in old French, but old ways to, to say very common things too, you know, and it was very enjoyable because it's a very creative language, which is not exactly the same now. And it was also interesting to me to imagine the way you kind of re, um, I mean, you're looking at your own body and watching the difference. And he's kind of studying his own body and wow is that the zoo of himself you know is looking at himself like wow what kind of creature do I become and it's it's a kind of with this you know the irony of Beckett it can become very funny and the you know the very dark humor he has as a very Irish man you know very Dublin humor and his his he's kind of experimenting this new body that is not able to do whatever he asks. And it's a kind of new invention, you know, like the first man who got to walk into the moon. It's like, oh, these legs are not working anymore. And, and you know, and I'm shaking so I can even open this yogurt and so what the hell am I doing? But he's kind of looking at that with a, with a kind of, um, you know, metaphysical point of view. And, and this makes things very different because I thought that he would be the only one to have enough humor to bring a bit of light uh, about oldness because that was his main subject even as a young author even then in his 40s he was he was writing about uh, oldness and the end of love and and difficult conditions so I thought that he would be able to carry that I think so I would have to say there is a it takes I think a courageous person to either do humor or tackle these topics because I don't think it's the majority that would like to. They might be distancing themselves from parts of reality. Whereas I like to go towards those topics or individuals connected to those topics because 
those are reality and the closer you are to oh this is a quote from a rapper what, what do you think about this concept don't run from the pain go towards it or anything that's difficult or challenging what do you think about that concept um, and 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 enjoyable in a way you know i think as a writer I, I think i do believe that um the, the quotes are quite true uh it's it's something if you want to treat subject and you choose not to have just a very elegant point of view but to have everything Beckett's gives no break i mean in his plays he's he's you know, asking us, well, he's telling us about everything, you know, the way he pee, the way he's washing, the way he can't wash, and the hole in the shoe, and you have everything, and, you know, those um, homeless stories, and and so we have dirt, we have everything, and I really like that, that the subject has, doesn't have to be always elegant and clean and, and, and bright and easy, that we can talk about this decay and, and make wonderful poetry about it or wonderful writing and and I think that um, that gives hope also to speak about difficulties and um, I never thought about him as an hopeless uh, writer that's quite the opposite he's fighting hard you know it's it's a kind of you know fail better fail again and you have this kind of uh, theory of yeah failing but with in a very elegant and bright way you know like I'm I'm going to try again and I wouldn't I won't give up and he doesn't give up and I like this way that he would keep this mind vivid and 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 that he would try to imagine it and I'm not able anymore to write, but then I'm going to tell stories to myself on, you know, and I, I like that and that he was able to, to remember the words, the poetry he liked and that to remember Joyce and to remember the end of Ulysses and the mono, the soliloquy of Molly Bloom and that he was able to tell himself story and be his best company in a way because he's carrying with him all the word that the writer has in his mind. So it's a very powerful thing to imagine, you know, being so free, even as an old man. The freedom is a nice feature. You mentioned as a writer, he is a writer. You are also a writer. I like to do writing. This is an important topic. There was a few days, like a few months ago, I didn't have my laptop for a few days and I just had my phone. It was useless to me for writing purposes for my mind. How important is writing for understanding your day or even yourself? Well, you know, you, I mean, I think all the writer has experienced that, you know, when you, you're very focused on, on your novel, usually after a while, you know, when you're completely uh, inside and, and after uh, a while, when you stop writing or you just reread what you've done, you, you feel like, what was I there? I mean, there's so much difference between the moment you you write it and the memories you have you know from the kind of specific mood you had during the writing and when you reread and you, you have bad and good surprises it's not even but it's there's a gap which is really the kind of state you are when you're writing uh, because you have to connect yourself to a different part of your brain which is very different to the social part or to the, the intellectual part. It's a creative part that was, which, which is very much more uh, to me, uh, close to um, the state you are when you're listening to music or, you know, you, you kind of, you're somewhere else, but you're there, you're very focused, but you have to give up with um, the word around you. So this kind of state, made you think in a way which is completely different to the kind of false self we all have in our everyday life. And when you're rereading, you're like, oh my God, there's so much part that I didn't know have put in that pages, which are very close to feelings and to sometimes very sad things or, but it's there. So it's probably part of yourself. You know, it's there, but you didn't know because you didn't intend it to put it on the paper, but it's just happened. So, you know, there's this, this kind of game of, you know, hiding and not hiding in the papers. Even if you're not writing about yourself, you have to write with yourself. It's the only material you have. So it's, it's all, always a way to learn and also um, a way to, to learn about the person you were at this specific moment 
and you will be someone else in two six months this which is very weird too <laughs> quickly that's true. many faces and also you hear voices which is you know which is something normal for a writer but you you can't tell people that you hear voices but you do hear your character in a way or another because you have to find out the way they speak and the the kind of word they use so you you kind of it's a, it's a kind of silly condition i have to say it is a silly condition. It almost sounds like silicon, the way combining those silicon, a silly condition. But one thing about that is that um, when I've written, I've gotten into a flow state like you're describing, and it's like a different world. And I look back at journal entries from six months ago, two years ago. I have them for like years and years. And it's like an alternate time period. I look, I don't look that same way in that way. Also, do you journal in some way? Do you write out your thoughts and keep them? I have a kind of notebook where I write everything which I don't really understand, like silly things I can see on the street, on the train, on the bus, on the metro, or things which I think completely um, unusual, but I will that I will forgive if I don't write it down. And sometimes, well, I kind of use it all the time because at the end, it's it's really you know when you're in it's not subject of the books but it would be small things that i would include in a general voice but it's useless at the beginning of a book because you you have to find the voice the voice of the character and all that and the music and but where you're in the way when i'm on the way i i use this, those little scenes it's a kind of way to to make things more incarnated in uh, and Sometimes, you know, you need several books in the books. You need small scenes that would help you uh, being a bit away from your history and that would help you get, you know, in and out. You need a bit of uh, um, a break in the stories. So it's nice to have a small details or would be included in the, in the story. So I, I have those. And sometimes it's like what happened for uh, the second novel, Les Amours Dispersés. Uh, I went uh, to Ireland and I took a train to go to Sligo. And, and on the train, I, I had this wonderful journey with the, the beautiful nature of Ireland. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a wonderful time. And there was these blue forests, these small trees, and it was so wonderful. The sky seemed so, um, so low. And, and you have all these... Um, these colors of the, the gray and the blue and the forest seems that there were creatures living inside, you know, small creature from the, the Celtic world. And, and, and I wrote all the way to go three hours, nonstop, everything I saw. And I thought, would I use that? Or, and when I was writing the first pack of the book, uh, I was thinking, oh, the second part, I don't know how I will use that. And when I reread, I, I could just use them and didn't change anything. It's it's weird sometimes, you know. And so I had written uh, actually this part of the book before the book, which is which is very strange, but can happen sometimes, you know. You can have a scene which is completely included. Uh, and so, but what I've noticed is that some at some point of a book, when you travel to a place which has some link with your story, it gives you a kind of new start. It gives you a kind of new, yeah, new impressions. And, and it's it's quite good for the book if you can have a, a kind of change in the middle by having a journey that will bring a new kind of energy and music and, and little scenes that you've experienced there. The journey is key. That's a good point. It'll switch up your mind state. It'll add something that would not have been there before. Sometimes it could not go to the next step without some sort of shakeup you'd get stuck at some point. You need that trip, a different view, a different smells, different people, some sort of connection. You mentioned, by the way, um, Ireland, French, your language. What do you think in and how important is your duality of languages to your work? I don't know if it's a duality. It's much more um, a way to help me with inhibitions, like I felt less inhibited to write about a subject which is far from me, 
and in a, and thinking of a foreign language. I write, of course, in French, but I because they were Irish characters, um, I had this kind of double thinking that, oh, what you would say in English? What would be the English for that? And so I have this little uh, tour inside my head with, oh, English would be there. And, and so I feel much more free and very far from the kind of language I've been you know, raised in and I've been reading so much in French and which is you know, um, another part of myself. And I had this kind of Irish connection since my childhood and, and this other identity of myself, which is in another language with all the people and all the connections and another experience as a reader too because I'm, I'm reading a lot in English too. And that's a kind of different music in my ears, but sometimes it's the same. For example, I've, I've read, of course, Beckett in the two languages, and it was so interesting to me to have the two and the differences in, you know, he had sounds new things when he was translated himself in English. And, but at the same time, I felt the same thing and I had this same writer, you know, it, it, as a reader, the same experience. It's it's very funny because you really recognize exactly the same person behind, but you have the two musics. And uh, so I do have this kind of schizophrenia, uh, not really as, um, it's not something, a trick I found. It's just happened because I wrote about Beckett first and I thought, oh, maybe I could uh, bring his Irish side in the book. And that would be a good way to pay a tribute because in France, we, we kind of, we are very possessive with Beckett and completely forgot that he was an Irish man and nobody knows much about this part of his life. You know, he's all, it's all about France and the, fa the fact that he, he wrote in French. But I found it very helpful to have a second word inside me to help me create. And it's also because I wanted to write in a different way so I have a multi, multi elements. Uh, there's first the two languages. So sometimes I use English in French. I would say English expressions in French, or uh, I, you know, I help myself with the English structure in French to change my own language. So to create in a new way. And there's also the fact that they are writers. I mean, I'm not. I mean, the third book. I can talk to you about that. Won't be a writer, but. These two great men, which are Beckett and Yeats, they have their own word as writers. So it's also something to have this imagination and you use your imagination to go from their work to yours. So it's it's a kind of um, dialogue you try to have with these wonderful masters. And we're, we're, whereas, you know, um, I, I, I couldn't feel like, oh, I'm going to start and write my own stories and they would be completely fresh and new because there's, you know, centuries of literature behind you and behind everybody. So it's kind of, no, you know, you just, you take your masters with you and you'll see what comes out, you know, and you pay the tribute, but you write yourself too. So, and we'll see how it's going. This is a wonderful message about the link to the past. I think about some of us as creators, as a continuation, kind of like in the Olympic race where you're handing off the baton of uh, whoever is in our realm. Like I have done that with some philosophers. I'm kind of their link from the past to now. Maybe an evolutionary biologist will be Charles Darwin. Now we have maybe Richard Dawkins and so on. It's like a link through time, through people. And without that, the message would not have continued. It's almost like it had to be. There had to be a link for each one. That's why they've, they've come so far anyway, and it is in each of us. So it's a very important element, I would say. I see it that way. Like we are the, the carriers of certain thoughts or certain concepts in a way. Now, you had mentioned uh, Beckett, but you also mentioned Yeats. What do you take from Yeats? What can you tell us? We may not know so much about him. Well, Yeats uh, happened in a kind of, you know, he arrived in a kind of cameo appearance in my first book because uh, Yeats' brother, Jack Yeats, was a, a famous painter and he was a good friend of uh, Sam Beckett's. So Yeats kind of arrived in a very, you know, uh, unnatural way in the book because there was this story about 
Jack Yates and and Beckett says, oh, Jack was still the brother of Yates, you know, because he has every, because the Yates, which is the most famous, who's the most famous is, of course, William Butler Yates, who was a great, great poet, uh, Nobel Prize to first Nobel Prize of uh, the Republic of Ireland. And uh, he was also very important for the independence of the country. So he was a very famous uh, politician and senator, and he really helped um, you know, and unburied the Celtic past of uh, Ireland and uh, really to make the country shine again and uh, be really proud of their own literature and the Gaelic word and all that. So there's all these wonderful stories about Yeats, which is the great, great poet of the nation in Ireland. He's a very um, uh, important man and figure. And uh, and at the same time, he, is, he has this crazy story that, you know, he has been very much in love with his muse, Maud Garn, who was a very important militant for uh, independence too. But she kind of refused three times uh, his, uh, you know, him to marry him. And, and 20 years later, you know, he asked her daughter and she said no too. So there was a kind of miserable story about his, his love life. And at the same time, his, he has those wonderful poetry, which is uh, completely built on that suffering from this uh, love uh, and condition love he had and uh, for her and and this this is a wonderful thing and um, and at the same time he became this very important man and had a kind of second life as a politician and um, and you know married another woman who was a kind of witch uh, connected to mystical not work. a witch yeah a witch and uh, and so there's a lot of stories. Uh, his biography is wonderful. And you have this, this poetry, which is um, unbelievable because he was a quiet, private person. He was a very shy man. And, uh, you know, they said that he was a virgin until he was 30. So it was a kind of very, very antisocial in a way, you know, very, very private. And at the same time, as a writer, he's completely fearless. He's, uh, you know, he has this uh, wonderful poem about uh, Crazy Jane and uh, and uh, who's that old woman uh, saying how much desire she has and uh, no matter if nobody wants to hear about it. And so there was all this, this wonderful story about, yeah, Crazy Jane's who wanted to... Um, uh, to, to, to say to the world how much she has desire and still has desire even if nobody wanted to hear about it and and he was he, he was doing that and writing those stories at a time where the church was quite powerful in Ireland and it was very you know difficult to do that and he didn't care and so he was a wonderful um, a wonderful writer to you know to discover and to write about but there was also this connection with France he died in France quite accidentally, uh, you know, he was there uh, because he was in bad health and needed to have a bit of sun. So he stayed in the south of, in southeast of France. And, and before he died, he said to his, to his wife, you know, buried me here because he didn't want any national funeral. And after a year when everybody's forgotten me, uh, you can bring me back to Sligo, to, to Ireland. But then the war, happened you know he was in 1939 and so there was the war it was absolutely impossible to bring him back to to Ireland and the French people who didn't have a clue about who was this Irish poet you know they just uh, in this small symmetry of um, the south of France they put him in a, in a common grave to you know to make some space for the soldiers and and after the war in 1948 when um the minister uh, of foreign affairs uh, asked for, you know, the comeback of the great father of the nation, the great uh, William Butler Yeats, and the French was were like, oh my God, we know how we're going to do that, and and there was a wonderful article in the Irish Times, uh, you know, with the letters. Uh, they, they published the letters between the embassies and, you know, diplomats saying, oh, my God, and how we find the bones and the thing. And all this story became completely absurd. You know, what are we going to put in the coffin? And and I found this story kind, you know, funny in a way because it's completely crazy because, of course, you know, it happens to be funny because you say, oh, uh, 
are, are they going to put a foot or an arm or leg or you know whatever it's it's been a crazy <laughs> but at the same time it asks the question what's left from someone i mean in in the body in you know and and the spirit of course and and you know you have those idea that this poet who was a quite mystical man you know who had um, all this um, influence in in um, uh, spiritism and and uh, occultism who was very much interested in that because it get, it helped me finding visions and brought new poetry to him you know new visions <clears throat> so this man who had this life you know with a lot of mysticism and in, involved in mysticism and, and occultism who kind of disappeared in the air and nobody knows where he is between these two countries had a death that really suits him in a way you know this body which we don't know where he is and there's this wonderful poem you know um uh, among the clouds above them so maybe there we don't know but um anyway i i found the story interesting and it was a link between france and an island and where i read his biography i found a lot of links between france and islands and starting with Maud Gone. And so that's that's what happened. I very much like these themes. I focus on these themes regularly, fearlessness, time in the big picture, and how we take the weight of it. Sometimes it looks like individuals may be alive, but they're not giving their time the weight that it has such that when they get to later on, there's nothing but maybe regret or I didn't get it. Whereas the people who can feel it early on, uh, which may have more um, extended temporal soul, if you will, can feel like, oh, okay, it's it's something that's it's here and it's there. And the uh, only thing that can keep me from getting to a full version of it is my internal fear of some sort. So it's like a, these themes are a big factors in my existence. Now, of the second book of yours, is it possible... We can have a wonderful reading of it. Le Amour, I, my pronunciation is going to be a challenge, but Les Am Amours de Species. I, it's tough. <laughs> of course. That would be great. How would you pronounce the title of it again? Les Amours Dispersés. Les Amours Dispersés. Yeah, quite good. Wonderful. If you can give us a passage of that and then afterwards uh, describe what is happening there. All right. Of course. What a delight, by the way. First time on the Armin show, never before. Maybe again in the future. Le cercueil est si petit, on dirait celui d'un enfant. Comme si la vieille avait fait le tour de la vie, une boucle parfaite, comme si elle était revenue au point de départ. Madeleine se demande si la voisine y est à l'étroit, si l'agent des pompes funèbres a pris la peine de gifler l'oreiller satiné de le regonfler avant d'y déposer sa tête, si elle est confortablement installée sous le couvercle. Quatre silhouettes identiques en costume soulèvent la bière, la hissent avec facilité jusqu'à leurs épaulettes. Au fil des années, la vieille est devenue de plus en plus légère. À 90 ans passés, elle est partie plus svelte qu'une liane. Elle est allée au bout du bout, morte de sa belle mort dans son sommeil, une fin qu'on se souhaite, se dit Madeleine qui marche derrière le cercueil et la famille, accompagnant sa voisine jusqu'à son dernier chez elle. Elle s'est éteinte sans souffrir, au petit matin, à l'heure où d'ordinaire elle s'éveille. Elle a fait une sorte de faux départ. Ses paupières se sont ouvertes, puis refermées aussitôt. Elle en est restée là. Madeleine voudrait partir de la même façon, en tirant humblement sa révérence. Quelque chose lui dit qu'il n'en sera pas ainsi. Elle imagine plutôt la douleur au bras gauche, la chute à se rompre le cou sur le tranchant des marches, le pas de l'éléphant s'enfonçant dans sa poitrine, le téléphone impossible à atteindre. La vieille voisine, quant à elle, a vite tranché les questions relatives à la dernière demeure. Pas de fantaisie, une cérémonie classique, une messe à l'église Saint-Joseph et une inhumation au vieux cimetière de Saint-Pancras. Elle s'en va au milieu de l'été, baignée par les rayons qui font briller le frêne de son cercueil. Elle part se blottir sous la pierre fraîche, les pieds dans l'eau, face à la mer qui a servi de miroir, qui l'a vue vieillir et blanchir. Une mort accomplie. La vieille était prête depuis plusieurs années. 
Elle attendait de basculer avec patience, avec curiosité, avec la gourmandise de la croyante qui attend son paradis. Thank you so much for that. Can you tell us what was happening in that portion? That's the very beginning of the book. And the main character, which is called Madeleine, she has, um, before she hears about this story about Yeats's common grave, she has someone of her family who's been uh, one of the death of the common grave. And she, she hears about this crazy story that some part of the common grave has been put in a coffin to bring back to Ireland. So she, she's scared about the fact that the member of her family would be in the coffin instead of the poet. But before everything is in her mind, before we know about that, that's the very beginning of the book where Madeleine goes to a funeral. And it's a kind of happy funeral because it's a, it's a very old neighbor who died, an old lady that she liked very much in her late 90s. And she had a very accomplished life. And it's a kind of beautiful, Uh, funeral because it's it was a very good life she had and she really wanted to finish her life and so it's it's a kind of happy moment peaceful moment she had what she wanted and now she will know because she was a very christian lady she would finally know what happens and her coffin is going back on the coffin of her mo own mother um of the old lady's old mother and so it's going back to her tommy as she she was starting back you know to the very beginning going back to her mother. Isn't there, do you ever think about this link between our early part of life and our late part of life and how they're almost reasonably identical in some ways? There's a middle like upper portion, but these two parts are quite similar, like a child and a very old person. Do you ever think about that relationship? Yes, and I had this, this idea when I had to write this funeral scene and I thought, oh my God, when you open the grave, It's a kind of human tree in woods, you know, all the coffin, you know, uh, and uh, one in another. And I thought, oh, my God. And, you know, if she goes back to her, her mother's, you know, um, you know, it's it's a kind of, oh, life was just a small event and everything is back to the start, to the beginning. And it's a very difficult notion for us to imagine that it's it's a very short time. And even for an old lady, she was almost almost. 100 years old, but it's, it's the same, you know, she goes back to the members of the family in the same place. And it's, it's, uh, it's as if we all ended in a common grave in a way, which is family. And it's, it's a, a very, um, I mean, it's very beautiful to think things that way, because it's, it's also the way that uh, there's a kind of continuity with nature, with the, With the dust and and the earth at the same times and for her who believes um it, it's not a sad moment and she kind of accepted this human condition and i find it quite inspiring that you could maybe have a death and a funeral that actually are not only sad they're not only sad they're remembrance moments i think that the way a funeral is taken reflects a bit on how the person sees their own life because if they see themselves reaching for more and it was always a jovial let's say challenge of sorts then the funeral is like oh a remembrance of things that happen in a glorious time whereas if the person may be full of uh regrets or things left alone then the funeral will be a sad element because they'll be thinking that person who passed away they probably have things that they didn't do they don't get to do now so they're sad about that It's like they're placing themselves in the person that's gone. And so uh, it's heavier for those who already have a heavier existence. Do you think about the personalities of people as they go through their existence, how it affects them? I don't know. I feel like um, a quite happy thing that can happen is that what you have, what you wanted is like, okay, for example, this lady wanted to die in the place she always lived. She is in this beautiful city, which is by the sea. And there's this wonderful symmetry, which is maybe the most beautiful symmetry on earth, you know, which is uh, rocks falling on the sea. And you have the graves, you know, uh, there. And, uh, 
and it's a beautiful place and you have a vision on all the Mediterranean and it, you know sea and it's you have the trees around and it's and it's beautiful stones there and um and I thought you know maybe the place is that's what it says you know that the sea has been a mirror to her and so it has seen her you know getting older and gray and 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 white and and then she ends in the place she wanted and I thought that it would be yeah probably the way you live and the way you can accept that it can stop one day uh, makes things easy for people who'd stay you know if you kind of accept even at a young age that this will stop at some point that that maybe it's in it's easier to to experience and to have the life you wanted than if you kind of live in a in a non-stop action that makes you think that this would last forever because it, you know it's it's a kind of taboo and um and it's getting worse and worse like you know the taboo is is stronger now and um and i find it's a kind of relief to 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 imagine what's left and um yates is wonderful for that because you know he's he's died a long time ago and you, we have all his po the poetry he left and he's very much alive by this way so it's it's a very optimistic way of thinking of what's left from someone it represents it's like a hopefulness if you will and the taboo element you just mentioned dark humor includes that in it to bring up those things it's funny because the person who represents the difficult items i would say is probably internally has more let's say well-being they're they're tackling them versus the individual who pushes them away uh, it's almost like they're saying, I don't have the wherewithal to be able to touch on those things. So even though it might look like they're not uh, connected with those items, it's just because they're pushing them away. Reality is still reality. We will always run into it at some at some point. I always connect things. The way, you know, I had this idea that this wonderful old lady would say, you know, I will have a very happy death. You know, I've done what I've done and I'm happy to know I'm going to this place and, and I'm fine with it, you know. And I like this idea that some people could, could have this wisdom. And of, of course, some people do. Some people do, that's true. And others can pass on what they know to others. One thing I want to check on here is in your works going forward, what are themes you want to continue to express to the readers who take them in? What do you want them to take from your works? Oh my God. Uh, I don't want to tell them what they have to take. I want them to be free. And um, I hope they can, um, they can experience the kind of music I had in my mind when I was writing, you know, this kind of music of the words and the rhythm. And this is very important to me because it's it's a kind of um, it's the, it's something that we enjoy as as a reader and as uh, as a writer too, to work in a kind of rhythm of the words and the sentences that would would help you go on and on you know in the reading and uh, to me it's a kind of magic uh, magical experience we have every time we open a book and find a voice it doesn't happen all the time but it's a very it's a very enjoyable thing when you find a voice of someone that will read that you can't stop you know uh, reading because you have this 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 voice going through the paper inside your mind and telling you her story in a in a certain way and um and this is i hope uh, they would find it would take away from that now this one just came to mind for me as a perspective i have spoken with many individuals you have spoken with many individuals on, on school too. I'll try. And what, what are some key moments that you have remembered from your discussions? Are there any standout individuals or pieces that uh, you remember clearly to this day? Oh my God, there's a lot. Um, uh, I remember meeting this wonderful writer Anne and Wright on the Bay of Dublin looking at the seals 
and it was quite you know it, it was it wasn't a very bright day and uh, it wasn't sunny and it was very irish weather and and there was this wonderful dark color of the sea and this wonderful rocks you know and um, it was on a place called 40 foot you know it's uh, very close to the Martello Tower where Ulysses, Joyce's Ulysses begins, you know, in this powerful place. And I remember Anne and Wright uh, saying to me, you know, we're all living by the bay, all the writers trying to write after Joyce did. And, you know, my God, what can we write after him? And there was this kind of uh, power of the shadow of the master being there, you know, in his tower, but also this um this energy of of the writer you know writing again and again after that and and she said some very powerful things about the way she was inspired and the way you can be inspired by what you read and not completely you know um uh, inhibited by what you read before and this this is a kind of small path between um between reading and writing and and try to finding your own way in the middle of what existed and i find it quite inspiring to imagine things this way i like that you brought up that point i have to say locations where someone was bringing thought or production or whatever kind of energy a location has had it then you can go there now and you probably will still feel that there's certain areas that are more conducive to uh, maybe thought Thoreau with his Walden Pond, maybe uh, without Walden Pond, it would not have been so good for him to be pensive and coming up with concepts. There's certain places that give you more of like, I can go and be and other places where you don't, you feel maybe constricted and that's not where to go and be expressive and creative. This is a wonderful, t many topics come to my mind here. This is, I usually... For the, the the listeners would know cover a lot of nonfiction. Actually, that'll be my last point. You cover reality and go into reality, but through fiction. Why that distinction is nonfiction more dry and boring? What are your thoughts? I think I probably don't have a very clear distinction be between reality and fiction in, in, in the way I think <laughs> as an everyday life. I mean, I will I always find a lot of fiction in the daily life and sometimes much more than the real fiction. And, um, and uh, I think fiction is just the way you write things, the tone, the voice, the subjective point of view. Fiction is not about what you're talking about. It's not about what you're writing about. It's the kind of vision you have and the kind of point of view, the way it's, the way you, you put on in words and the way it's it, because it's through your eyes because it's through your own experience of life because it's it's been through what you felt and you turn it the work is about language it's not about story i mean this the story can be told by a lot of, can be told by a lot of different people and would be different you know it's it's the kind of um sensitive personal um, relationship you have to the language that would bring fiction and the kind of also narrative you will build you know uh, I, I find very important to find a very specific architecture that would go with the story and and this is the two things language and the architecture of the book but uh, fiction is is everywhere and and much more in reality than all the things and I don't think very important um uh, to I think the, we can mix everything or start to imagine about real facts and go somewhere else because anyway I won't be very able to report in a very neutral way and uh, so and even you know at the radio I was doing this very personal documentaries and that's what I liked you know it's uh, it's uh, yeah the way you will uh, imagine and put on words and decide to edit and keep this and those and it would bring to something else and that's that's the same with the language I mean you you you're thinking of a character you're starting a story and then and it will go somewhere else that you've imagined and but 
at the same time, you know, new things come up, but at the end you finish what you want, you know, where you wanted to finish, to end at the beginning. But the journey has been very different to what you've noticed. And it's and it's great this way. So reality is a good beginning to imagination, in my point of view. I like that you end at the beginning. Also, at that point you brought up is something I had said before. I don't really find comedy to be I've done comedy before on stage, but I don't really connect to comedy because life has enough comedy yeah. uh, as it is for a comedian to go up and make jokes like I, I can go outside and find it and it's funnier to me because it's actually the case and it wasn't like formulated or created so we have some shared shared themes here wonderful thing here on this one here i will have to say my least glad to have had you join and detail quite a bit wonderfully and bring a new element of understanding that is not commonly covered here because it's more like science or kind of nonfiction material and this is a uh, but it links so that's a wonderful thing so i would like to thank you for having been on this episode of the show and maybe be back on in the future thank you very much that'd be great wonderful and we are out <laughs> <laughs>